Welcome to Lecture 4, Clouds and Seasons. Reading for this lecture is Chapter 3, pages 45 through 54, and 65 through 66. So in this lecture, we will be talking about clouds in detail. We will be discussing the different effects they can have on climate, both warming and cooling. And we will be talking about the types of clouds. It turns out they can be divided into categories. There are several types of clouds, and uh, each cl type of cloud has a certain name. You'll be learning the names of them and what they look like. So when you look in the sky, you'll be able to tell what type of cloud you're looking at. And then we will be discussing seasons. Okay, Why do we have seasons, and what are the important properties of them? So, here are a couple questions um, that it would be important to answer. Okay, it's important to answer. One, what role do clouds play on the Earth's climate? Okay, do they cause climate to warm or cool? Okay, and how so? Um, and what would happen to our climate if clouds were to increase or decrease? Okay. Um, with global warming in the future, uh, the, the number of clouds in the atmosphere could change, okay? And we'd like to know if, if there are more clouds, would that cause our climate to cool, warm, both, okay? What about if there were less clouds in the future? How would that impact climate, okay? So these are some questions that we um, would like to be able to answer. So when we talk about clouds, we need to be talk, talking about um, some important processes involving water, okay? Because clouds, it turns out, are made of water, okay? They are made of either um, liquid droplets or ice crystals or both, okay? So when you see a cloud, you're actually looking at a collection of liquid droplets, liquid water droplets, and or ice crystals in great enough concentration and volume to appear visible with the naked eye. Okay, So there is a misconception that clouds are made of water vapor, but water vapor is an invisible gas. Okay, You'll remember it's a natural greenhouse gas. We can't see it with the naked eye. Here are some important definitions involving uh, water processes, and we need to understand these definitions to help understand how clouds form. Evaporation. How would you define evaporation? Here's a hint. Notice the vapor here in the in the uh, in the word. Okay, e. Vaporation. So evaporation or evaporation, if that helps you, it's a process where a liquid changes into a gas. Okay. So it's the process where basically a liquid turns into gas. And you will remember that water has three different states or phases, okay? In fact, for any chemical, there could there are three possible states of matter. Solid and what do we call the solid state or phase of water? Ice, right? Liquid is the other is the next state or phase. And what do we call the uh, liquid state of water? Well, often we just call it water, right? Such as glass of water, okay, water in the ocean, water in a river. And then we have the gas state of matter, okay, and for and for water, we usually call that gas state vapor, okay. How about condensation? How would you define condensation? Well, it turns out that condensation is basically the reverse of evaporation. It's a process where a gas changes into a liquid. So for condensation, 
the changes from vapor to liquid if you're discussing water, okay? Um, in general, when you're talking about uh, any substance, okay, it could be carbon dioxide, it could be nitrogen, it's the process where the, from the gas state to the liquid state, okay? But for wa water, we, we know that the gas state is called vapor and the liquid state is called water or liquid. And condensation is very important in order to understand cloud formation. You'll remember that a cloud is a collection of liquid droplets and or ice crystals in great enough concentration and volume to appear visible with the naked eye. Or, in some cases, with glasses, right, for people like uh, myself. So, one way that clouds form is when, when uh, millions, even billions or more of t tiny water vapor molecules condense into liquid droplets. And when you have enough of those liquid droplets, okay, enough, a great enough um, space and, and, and uh, concentration of them, you can see a cloud, okay. How about precipitation? How would you define precipitation? Precipitation is any liquid or solid water that falls from the atmosphere to the ground. Example, rain. So precipitation is important to understand after cloud formation. Okay, It's not a part of direct part of cloud formation, but once the cloud has been made, precipitation can fall from the cloud. And it could be liquid or solid water. Okay, liquid precipitation, well, we know rain, right? Um, most of San Jose's uh, precipitation is in the form of rain, okay? Now, solid water is basically water in the solid state. We know in the ice state, okay? So frozen precipitation could be snow, the most common, okay? But there are others, and if any of you are from the Northeast, the Midwest, okay, or have spent substantial amounts of time in those regions of the country, you may be more familiar with other forms of um, frozen precipitation, okay, such as sleet, tiny ice pellets that have formed from rain, raindrops that are refrozen, uh, freezing rain, which occurs when raindrops freeze directly on contact with the surface that can coat, um, the surface with a thin layer of ice and make driving very hazardous, okay, even make walking tough. Creates a pretty picture, but a lot of um, issues for transportation. Um, on a personal note, I grew up as a kid in Portland, Oregon, and um, if freezing rain did occur there, perhaps anywhere from one to two times a winter on average, sometimes more than others, some years more than others, okay? Um, drizzle, by the way, is a form of liquid precipitation that, in which the droplets, the individual droplets or drops of water are smaller than raindrops. That's what differentiates rain and drizzle, the size of the falling drops. Okay. So, let's go into a little more detail about condensation, because that's really important to understand in order to have a grasp on how clouds form. Condensation is, again, the process by which water vapor changes into a cloud droplet with respect to water, okay? So when we're talking about water in particular, that chemical, H2O, we know condensation would mean the process where vapor turns into um, liquid or a cloud droplet, okay? Because a cloud droplet is a basically um, um, a unit of liquid water. Now, water vapor molecules, okay, water vapor molecules may stick or adhere to cloud condensation nuclei, which is abbreviated CCN, and grow to eventually form a cloud droplet. It turns out that CCN are extremely important for cloud formation, okay? It's very hard for water vapor molecules 
to spontaneously condense into liquid droplets without some sort of surface to condense onto. Um, in, for that to happen, for a water vapor molecule to turn directly into a liquid droplet, okay, condense into a liquid droplet, requires very high, um, what's called supersaturations. Okay, it means that the air atmosphere has more water vapor than it can hold, and that forces water vapor to condense out. It's very rare for that to happen. And so, basically, the water vapor molecule needs some type of surface or object in order to be able to condense. It needs something that, a surface where the con condensation can happen. And there's three major examples of cl cloud condensation nuclei, or CCN, as you see it in um, the yellow coloring. Do you know any? Hint. In general, all CCN are aerosols, microscopic solid or liquid particles suspended in the atmosphere that are not actually water, okay? There are solid or liquid particles that in um, chemical form besides water. Here's one, dust, okay? Dust particles can come from the ground, okay, can come from burning of uh, buildings and uh, uh, other surf uh, surfaces as well. And dust particles are one. Dust can also come from a volcanic eruption. Salt particles can act as a great CCN. You will recall that about 70% of the surface of Earth is covered by ocean. And we know the ocean is salt water, not fresh water. Okay, if any of you have gone surfing, you may remember that you have to, well, if you if you do it frequently, you'll know this very well. You have to go past the breakers as you're wading into the water and then swimming out to where you can ride the waves. You have to go past the breakers, and as you do so, you notice the water becomes more salty, okay? And you start to taste it. It doesn't taste very good. You, and you can smell it and taste it, especially if you get thrown off the surfboard, surfboard okay? Um, salt water, by the way, freezes at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, not 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, now, another form of CCN is smoke. Smoke particles can come from fires, like forest fires, okay, structure fires, they can come from deforestation, which could be a result of a forest fire, okay? They can come from volcanic eruptions, okay? Volcanoes can sometimes emit smoke particles. And all three of these uh, different substances can act as CCN. Now, how large are these... Um, different materials we're discussing, okay? You might be wondering, right? So here are the relative sizes of a cloud condensation nuclei, a cloud droplet, and a raindrop. So in red, you have the average size, and by size, um, what, that specific, what that specifically means is diameter, okay? So diameter. And you'll see that the average cloud condensation nuclei is about 0 0.002 millimeters in diameter, okay? It's very small, okay? Can't see it with the naked eye. The average cloud droplet size is 0 0.02 millimeters, okay? So still very small, 0 0.02 millimeters in diameter, but that's about 100 times the diameter of the average cloud condensation nuclei. Meanwhile, the average raindrop size is two millimeters diameter, okay? Now that's just an average. Some of the largest raindrops are on the order of five to six millimeters in diameter, okay? Five to six millimeters. Um, especially raindrops in the tropics where it's very warm and moist and the air can hold a lot of water vapor. Um, the raindrops there can become very large. And or the, the raindrop generally doesn't become larger than about 6 millimeters in diameter because then eventually um, it becomes like more likely to break up as it falls, okay, when it gets that large. Um, 
But the average raindrop size is two millimeters. Now what you'll notice is that the average cloud droplet kind of has the shape, kind of has the shape of a sphere, and the average raindrop size does as well. Contrary to um, popular conception, raindrops are not tear shaped. They're generally sphere or hamburger bun shaped, okay? Often sphere shaped though. And if you remember your um, uh, middle school or high school uh, algebra and geometry, you'll, you may remember, hopefully, that the volume of a sphere is equal to 4 thirds pi times pi times the radius cubed. Now, diameter is twice the radius, okay? So, what is significant is that because volume is proportional to the third power, the cube of the radius, and diameter is just twice the radius, the average raindrop is a million times the volume of the average cloud droplet, okay? When r radius or diameter increases by a factor of 100, volume, the space taken up, increases by a factor of 100 cubed, which is 1 million, okay? So what you see is that the average raindrop is tremendously, right, larger than the average cloud droplet, okay? And if you took, have ever taken a um, weather class, or if you ever plan to take one, you'll learn more about the details, about how this happens, how cloud droplets grow to uh, incredib inc incredibly larger sizes to form raindrops, okay? Because the average cloud droplet is, is far too small to be able to fall out of the cloud and what usually happens is it falls very slowly and evaporates, okay? So it usually doesn't make it very far um, below the cloud. Now for reference, the diameter of a human hair is about 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 millimeters. And that's about, oh, twice the diameter of the average cloud droplet, anywhere from twice to six times the uh, average cloud droplet diameter. Of course, some people have thinner or thicker hair than others, okay? Per on a personal note, my hair is very thick, okay? It's hard to contain, okay? It knots up easy. Um, but some ha some people have thin hair, right? And it's it's very wavy and it it's uh, easier to contain, perhaps, okay? Of course, for someone like Lil Wayne, okay, he'd have a much uh, thicker diameter of an individual dread, right, which is made up of God knows how many hairs put together, right? Okay, so um, here is a satellite image from September 2nd, 2004, okay, a little time, time lesson or a little history lesson, right? So this is about 12 years old now. And it's a very nice satellite image. It's an infrared satellite image. And not only does it show clouds, as sh which can be seen by the areas of white and gray swirling masses, okay, but it also shows temperature of land. You will remember the Stefan Boltzmann law that says basically the warmer an object, the more radiation emitted, okay? So there are a couple major types of satellite images, and you may have seen satellite images on um, the local news weather report, on the Weather Channel local forecast, on your app, Weather Channel app on your smartphone, or maybe your Yahoo Weather app, okay? Re um, so it turns out that cl the clouds reflect light, as does the surface, but the clouds tend to reflect more light than ma many types of surface. And so reflection of light is one f way to, for the, the satellites in space to deflect, detect clouds, okay, by the amount of reflection, okay? Areas of high reflectivity correspond to clouds. But another way that satellites can detect clouds, another type of satellite image is infrared, okay? Clouds are in the 
are higher up than the surface, with the exception of a cloud on the ground, we'll talk about a uh, stratus cloud on the ground, it's called fog. Generally, clouds are higher up than the surface, okay? And the higher the clouds, the um, cooler the temperatures of their tops in general, okay? Because as you go up in the atmosphere, it tends to get colder, okay? And the ground is warmer than the clouds in general. So the, the satellite can use the amount of radiation emitted, infrared radiation emitted, to determine locations of clouds. In a way, like the infrared camera work to see that person in the woods from lecture three, remember that? And also the, cloud the satellite image can be used to, de to determine um, surfaces that are warmer than others. Okay, so where you see the yellow, light yellow, you're looking at cooler surfaces. And then notice over the Sahara Desert, over parts of the, uh, the um, Middle East, you have these uh, darker colors which correspond to warmer surfaces. Because more radiation is being emitted, the, the satellite is detecting a greater amount of radiation emitted upwards, wh upwards which corresponds to a warmer temperature. The clouds, meanwhile, are are higher up and they emit less lower amounts of radiation, okay, which um, is uh, correlated with the, these uh, white and gray colors. So, um, talking about how clouds can impact radiation, okay. Um, let's talk, go into detail about cloud climate interactions. It turns out there are two effects that clouds have on climate. It's very important to understand the two. The first effect that clouds have on climate is the albedo effect. Okay, the albedo effect, and that's a cooling effect. Okay, you'll remember that albedo is, of course, the fraction of light reflected by an object or a surface. Higher albedo surfaces reflect more light. And the albedo effect of clouds has a cooling impact on climate, okay? Because it refers to how clouds can reflect sunlight. And that would, of course, cause, that alone would cause Earth's surface to cool because less sunlight makes it to the surface to get absorbed if more is reflected, okay? So clouds reflect incoming solar radiation, okay? You guys are um, learning a lot of terms, and you know you can sound smarter to your friends if you say clouds reflect incoming solar radiation versus clouds reflect sunlight, right? And the cloud droplet size and total water content determine the overall reflectivity. So it turns out if you're if you're wondering, well, um, what determines how reflective the cloud is, okay? Um, you may have noticed some clouds are darker than others. Um, the, the cloud droplet size is one, okay? So actually, how large the cloud droplet is, okay? On average, it's 0.02 millimeters in diameter, but it's just an average. How, how large it is, and also how much water is in the cloud will affect the reflectivity. Now, what about the second effect clouds have on climate? Can you think of a way clouds can impact climate besides the albedo effect, okay? And we're talking about radiation, okay? So we're not talking about, uh, say, you know, the effect of precipitation, okay? We're talking about how clouds interact with radiation and how that affects climate. Well, one is the albedo effect. Hint, think of, a, think of um, the uh, other uh, form of temperature effect. Instead of a cooling, a warming. The greenhouse effect, the greenhouse effect. Clouds, in general, are good absorbers and emitters of long wave radiation, okay? Some better than others, okay? Just like there are greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, that are able to absorb and emit wavelengths in, lo in the infrared spectrum, there are clouds that can do the same, some better than others, okay? And you are probably, in a way, familiar with these effects of clouds, okay? So on the next slide, we have a, 
nice um, real world example thought experiment to help you with thinking about the two effects of clouds on climate, specifically involving how clouds impact radiation or interfere, interact with radiation. Okay. So here's a nice thought experiment concerning clouds and day-to-day -day temperatures. Imagine that you are going camping in the Sierra Nevada with your friends, okay? Who likes camping? Um, I, I've personally uh, went camping a couple times in um, 2009, but I haven't really been camping since, okay? Really want to do it again. Now, on the first day and evening, it is cloudy, okay? So let's say you go up to the Sierra Nevada, right? Maybe you drive up Highway 80 or 50, okay? And you, you either do it late at night and get there and then sleep or um, you maybe drive in the morning and get there. And let's say on the first day, we're talking about the first full day, okay? So regardless whether you got in late at night or early in the morning, let's say you're talking about the first full day, okay? Now, it's on the first full day, Okay, during the daytime and the nighttime, it's cloudy, okay? So you get there and um, let's say if you got there in the morning, it's cloudy and it remains cloudy during the night. But then the second full day you're there, it is clear, okay? The clouds have gone and now it's clear. It's sunny during the daytime and it's clear at the nighttime. Based only on this information, which day would be warmer and which evening or night would be warmer, okay? So what I want you to do is pause the video, determine which day would be warmer, the first or second, which evening would be warmer, the first or second, and then explain why. And then come back to the video, replay it again. Okay. So, what I'm going to have you do is answer these two questions and explain your reasoning in a uh, discussion activity, okay? So that's what I'd like you to do. And later, after the discussion activities are submitted, okay, um, I'll be explaining um, my answer and reasoning, okay, what I was looking for. So, we've been discussing what clouds are and what they're made of. We've been discussing how they interact with radiation, both from the sun, okay, and the earth. Now let's discuss cloud types. So clouds can be divided into four or four quattro main categories, and three are based on height. We have high clouds and what you see in parentheses, sear, that's a Latin prefix. It turns out that the four categories of clouds are differentiated by Latin prefixes, okay? So any cloud that is a high cloud is actually going to begin with the Latin prefix sear, okay? And we'll be looking at some examples um, on the next slide, but a couple are cirrus and thin wispy high clouds and cirrostratus thin sheet-like high clouds. The middle category of clouds is alto. And this is interesting because in Spanish, in Espanol, alto means tall, right? Well, when you see a cloud name that begins with alto, it is a middle cloud. And you might be asking, well, how high are the high clouds? Okay, how, how, what's the elevation or altitude of the middle clouds? Don't worry, on the next slide, we have a nice summary slide of uh, the major types of clouds with the height ranges and uh, um, uh, pictures of each. So if we have high clouds, middle clouds, what do you think the third category that's based on height is? Low. And low clouds generally begin with strat. Okay. Then we have a fourth category for clouds vertical development. And the clouds of vertical development are special because they can actually exist in several, more than one cloud uh, uh, height range, okay? 
So it turns out that cumuliform clouds, clouds that begin with cumu, such as cumulonimbus, a thunderstorm cloud, can start in the region of low clouds and then build up, and eventually their tops can reach where you find high clouds. Okay. So they have a the clouds of vertical development have their own category because they can't be differentiated based on height alone because they can exist in multiple um, different height categories, if you will. Now, there are actually only two types of clouds that produce rain, okay? And clouds producing rain have the nim root. Nim is Latin for rain, okay? Nim means rain. And the two types of clouds that can produce rain are nimbostratus and cumulonimbus, okay? So a nimbostratus cloud produces rain, a cumulonimbus cloud produces rain, okay? Um, clouds can be made of what? What are the two uh, substances, basically, or two uh, different particles, okay, if you will, clouds can be made of? They can be made of liquid droplets. They can be made of ice crystals or both. So cloud it's made of liquid droplets would generally have the prefix strat, they'll be low clouds. Because low clouds are lower than middle or high to lower in the alti in the atmosphere. They're at lower altitudes and so they're warmer, okay? Whereas high clouds, okay, begin with Sierra, are so high, they're so um uh Great in altitude, that generally they're cold. They're it's so cold up there. They're only made of ice crystals. Okay. Now, the middle clouds, alto, can be made of both liquid droplets and ice crystals because they're at a level in the atmosphere that um, where you have both liquid droplets and ice crystals. And finally, cumuliform clouds can be made of both because they may start out where. Uh, you have liquid droplets, no ice crystals, and build to heights where there's only ice crystals. So now let's take a look at the different cloud types in, in uh, picture form. Okay, this is a great figure, okay? It's very powerful, right? There's so much information on it. So let's go category by category for clouds. So we have low clouds, okay? We have stratus. Stratus is a dark gray sheet-like cloud, okay? Often covers the entire sky. Can keep it um, dark, okay? It can, it, because it reflects a lot of sunlight, okay? It appears dark to, from below because it's reflecting so much sunlight. From above, it actually appears white or lightly colored. Um, in the Bay Area, especially close to the coast, okay, in the summertime, um, in the uh, the early summertime and the late spring, sometimes the stratus will be, um, form and and build in, uh, move in overnight, and then burn off slowly during the morning time, okay. When stratus is on the ground, that's fog, okay. Stratocumulus are also low clouds, but they're puffy, okay. And what you see is that the low clouds are found below 6,500 feet altitude. So below about a mile above the surface. Okay. Cumulus clouds are different from stratocumulus in that they generally have greater vertical extents. So they're about the same horizontal width, okay, or, um, but they're, um, they build up higher. They kind of look like uh, cotton balls, okay. Now, nimbostratus is basically a stratus cloud that's thickened and is now producing rain. And nimbostratus clouds produce light to moderate steady precipitation. Okay? So they produce precipitation that is not too heavy. It's light to moderate and it lasts for a uh, fair amount of time. 
that's different from the, the precipitation that forms from cumulonimbus cloud. Okay, cumulonimbus cloud is the other type of cloud besides nimbus stratus that produces rain. And cumulonimbus clouds will produce heavy showery precipitation. Okay, part of the reason that the precipitation is showery as opposed to steady from nimbus stratus is because the cumulonimbus clouds generally move faster, they're thunderstorm clouds and they move faster than the nimbostratus clouds, okay? So the precipitation doesn't last as long. But because the cumulonimbus clouds can build, vertically extend to incredibly high altitudes, that actually is the reason why the precipitation can be heavier. Now when you get above 6,500 feet above the surface, you're getting into the region of middle clouds, okay? And in Specifically, middle clouds are found from about 6,500 to 23,000 feet above the surface. And there's two major types of middle clouds, alto cumulus and alto stratus. Alto cumulus are light to moderate gray puffs, and they appear smaller than strato cumulus, okay, as you can see. And the reason they appear strato cumulus is not so much because they're actually smaller, the puffs are smaller in size in reality, but they're farther away from the eye, okay? Of course, we know as we get farther away from an object, it appears smaller, right? So that's why they appear smaller to our eyes than stratocumulus, okay? They're higher up, they're more than a mile away from the surface. Alto stratus is a dark gray sheet-like cloud that appears to give rise to a watery sun, okay? The sun will be dimly visible. You can see the sun through it, but it'll appear distorted, okay? And kind of watery, especially along the edges, okay? You won't be able to make out a clear, um, clear uh, distinction between the edges of the sun. And that's, di the alter stratus is different from stratus in the sense that stratus usually is uh, um, completely blocking the sun, okay? So when stratus is present in the sky, you generally won't be able to see the sun, but you can see the sun through alto stratus, although not um, completely clearly. When we get above 23,000 feet, now we are in the region of high clouds, and generally these are only composed of ice crystals because it's so cold, okay? Cirrocumulus clouds are puffy clouds, and they're generally lighter in color than altocumulus or stratocumulus, and they appear smaller. They appear as small, rounded puffs, giving rise to a mackerel sky. They can appear as fish scales, okay? And again, they're, they're, they're far away. They're, okay, 23,000 feet above the surface, that's more than four miles away, and so they appear very small to the eye, okay, at the surface. Cirrostratus are very thin sheet-like clouds and they can produce a halo around the sun but because they're so thin they will generally um, um, allow the sun to be completely visible. You can generally see the sun through the uh, cirrostratus clouds well. And then we have cirrus clouds which are thin wispy clouds, okay? Sometimes called mare's tails. Now, cruising altitude of commercial aircraft is between about 30 to 40,000 feet. 30 to 40,000 feet. So, commercial aircraft generally fly in the region of high clouds. Okay, and part of the reason commercial aircraft fly up there is because there's no smaller planes, okay, to worry about. Only generally the larger um, commercial flights are up there. The air is thinner, so for less, there's less drag, and for a given thrust, the aircraft uh, can travel faster, okay. And the ride is smoother than below about 10,000 feet, okay, where you have turbulence, okay, more turbulence, okay, from uh, convection thermals, okay, and so. It's cold up there, okay? It's very cold up there. If, um, in general, the uh, uh, temperature decreases by about 3.6 thousand, 
3.6 degrees Fahrenheit for every thousand feet one travels up in the atmosphere, at least in the lower atmosphere called the troposphere, okay, which is about, about which extends about the lowest um, uh, 11 to 12 kilometers, okay. And because of that, because in general it, it gets colder about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit every thousand feet you go up, that means that when you are at about 30,000 degrees um, uh, 30,000 feet above sea level, 30,000 feet above sea level, it's about 108 degrees Fahrenheit colder, okay? It's about, so it's around 100 degrees Fahrenheit colder at the, um, at 30,000 feet at cruising altitude compared to at sea level, okay? And it's about 80, to 80 degrees Fahrenheit colder at 23,000 feet. So it's very cold up there, okay? If, you, if you've flown on some airlines like Delta, you can actually um, look at, examine the actual outside air temperature as you fly. And it's, um, it might be anywhere from minus 50 to minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit at cruising altitude. And because it's so cold up there, that's why the clouds are made only of ice crystals, okay? Um, so what's also interesting is that airplanes can form clouds, okay, because their exhaust can act as nuclei, okay? And it's so cold up there that generally any uh, vapor that, f that, uh, form that attaches and undergoes a phase change on the exhaust would turn directly into ice, okay? And, and so the airplanes flying at cruising altitude can form their own clouds, high clouds, called contrails, okay? You may have heard of contrails. Now, let's think more about the warming and cooling effects of clouds. Let's consider two types of clouds. Low clouds and high clouds. And let's ask, how is the Earth's surface energy budget different for these two cloud types? Okay. Now, low clouds appear dark and thick to our eyes. Okay, an example would be stratus. Okay, they're thick, so they are excellent reflectors of solar radiation. Okay, so clouds like stratus, okay, reflect... Uh, solar radiation very well. Low clouds are excellent reflectors of solar radiation since they're thick. Now they appear dark to I, our eyes because they reflect a lot of solar radiation, okay? But if you've ever flown above stratus clouds, okay, you, you'll notice they appear very white from above, okay, as opposed to, from, to below. So if you're flying into San Francisco airport in the spring, in the summertime, and you see the stratus layer, the marine layer, okay, You'll notice it appears very light and sheet-like. And it turns out that these clouds are good absorbers and emitters of infrared radiation. Okay. So low clouds are excellent re at reflecting solar radiation. Okay. Excellent in terms of their contribution to the albedo effect. And they're good absorbers and emitters of infrared radiation. Okay. So they're good at contributing to the greenhouse effect. What about high clouds? They're light and thin to our eyes, okay? Why do you think, um, or how do you think they interact with solar radiation if they're thin, okay? Think about how low clouds are thick and so they are excellent reflectors of solar radiation. Well, since high clouds are thin, they in fact are fair or poor reflectors of solar radiation, okay? When solar radiation interacts with high clouds like Cirrus, Cirrostratus, and Cirrocumulus, it generally passes through, okay? Most of the solar radiation um, from above will pass through high clouds because they're so thin, okay? They're so thin that solar radiation easily passes through them. Now they are 
good or excellent absorbers and emitters of infrared radiation. Okay. So, now let's think about changes in clouds, okay? Remember we were asking that question about what would happen to climate if clouds were to increase or decrease, okay? So let's say that the number of low clouds increased, okay? The number of low clouds increased, okay, in a change in climate, okay? Um, perhaps there's more evaporation in the future world. In fact, that's generally happening. As the world planet warms, there's more evaporation off the ocean, okay? And so more water vapor in the atmosphere, and that can form more clouds. And let's say there are more low clouds. My question is, how would that affect the surface temperature? Would it cool or warm the surface? Okay. So if there are more low clouds, will the surface, Earth's surface, warm or cool? And why? Think about that. The answer is cool the surface because cooling outweighs warming. Okay. Remember, the low clouds are excellent reflectors of solar radiation, okay? And they are good absorbers and emitters of infrared radiation. But the question is, what are they better at doing? Reflecting solar radiation or absorbing and emitting infrared radiation, okay? They're, they are better at reflecting solar radiation than absorbing and emitting infrared radiation, okay? Even though they're excellent at they're, even though they're good at contributing to the greenhouse effect, they're excellent at the, their uh, contribution to the albedo effect. So they generally the cooling outweighs the warming. That's why overall they cool the surface. What about increases in high clouds? How will that change Earth's surface temperature? Okay, so think about this. Go back if you need to, to look at how high clouds interact with solar radiation and uh, infrared radiation. So increases in high clouds will actually warm the surface. Warming outweighs cooling. Because high clouds, remember, are fair or poor at reflecting solar radiation, whereas they're good or even excellent at absorbing and emitting infrared radiation. So it's very apparent, hopefully, that they're better uh, at contributing to the greenhouse effect. Okay, They're better at absorbing and emitting infrared radiation then reflecting solar radiation, so they have a greater warming effect, greater contribution to a warming effect, the greenhouse effect, than contribution to a cooling effect. The warming outweighs the cooling. So overall, an increase in high clouds would warm the surface. Here's a nice figure that can be used to help understand how clouds impact different the two major um, types of radiation that they interact with solar shortwave and infrared long wave and so here are high clouds this could be cirrus clouds okay what happens the incoming solar radiation shown by this yellow arrow comes in and most of it passes through notice very little is reflected okay most of it passes through because they're thin okay and then some re solar radiation reflected by the surface, okay? It could be by snow and ice, okay? It could be by desert. Of course, most of it gets absorbed. So red represents infrared or long wave radiation. Yellow represents solar radiation in the form of short wave. So the Earth emits its outgoing radiation. And you see some of that is absorbed by the high clouds and then sent back to the surface okay re-emitted back downward some is re is some passes through okay and some is emitted upward okay now here are low clouds what does type of cloud does this look like it's puffy you see it's a low cloud here given by the caption and it's puffy and it's not that vertically developed this is probably a stratocumulus cloud right Okay, cumulus clouds are found in the region of low clouds, but they are considered a vertical development cloud, and cumulus clouds generally are more vertically extended than these ones, okay? So here's our incoming solar radiation. Now notice, 
Very little of it passes through. Very little of it passes through. Okay? Much different from high clouds. For high clouds, most, the large majority of the incoming so shortwave radiation passes through them. But for low clouds, very little passes through. Okay? Some gets absorbed and some gets reflected. Okay? The thickness of the arrow, as you can see, basically is referring to uh, amount. Okay, the thicker the the uh, arrow, the more, right? And so, by the way, you might be asking, oh well, how come you know when we add this thickness of this reflected solar radiation and this thickness of the radiation, the solar radiation passes through, how come it doesn't looks like it equals the initial? incident radiation, well some gets absorbed too, right? Now then, the Earth emits outgoing long wave radiation to space, and you gotta remember that you have to remember that the low clouds are good ex are good absorbers and emitters of infrared radiation. Okay? So you see a great deal of radiation emitted back down. To the surface, and also a great deal emitted um, up, and you might be wondering why. Okay, how can the clouds emit so much radiation up and down? Well, remember, low clouds like star cumulus, they're low; they're below 6,500 feet. They're warm; they're almost the same temperature as the surface. In some cases, they are the same temperature as the surface, so they can emit basically as much or nearly as much radiation as the surface. That's why you see the arrow showing the outgoing radiation, long wave radiation from the top of the cloud, and the arrow showing the downward directed radiation from the cloud, nearly as large as the arrow from Earth's surface. Okay. Different story for high clouds though, because, because they're higher in the atmosphere, they're cooler, okay? Even though they are good absorbers excuse me, even though they are good or even excellent absorbers and emitters of infrared radiation, they're so cool, cool in temperature that they don't emit much, nearly as much radiation um, back to the surface or upward as what's emitted by the surface itself. Okay? Now, what we see is that clouds can both cool and warm the Earth. Okay? And clouds are complicated because um, some clouds have, are better at cooling, some clouds are better at warming, but whether a cloud's albedo effect or greenhouse effect dominates depends on the time of day as well, okay? So overall, low clouds tend to cool the surface, high clouds tend to warm the surface, but whether a low cloud actually is at the time, at a time and place, is causing a cooling or warming effect will depend on if it's day or night, okay? Um, but if you're going to look at the effect of all clouds on climate, okay, taking into account all these different cloud types and how the clouds affect uh, climate based on their, their uh, contribution to the albedo and greenhouse effect, and look at that over the net over time, what you'd see is that overall clouds tend to cool the earth, okay? In general, the effect of all clouds on climate is a cooling effect, okay? But it's complicated, okay? Let's look at some nice pictures of clouds, okay? These pictures are from either Meteorology Today or Essentials of Meteorology by Ahrens. The books are very similar, okay? Here we have a nice blue sky and we have some thin wispy clouds okay and here are here are some trees what kind of clouds do you think these are cirrus these are cirrus clouds hmm here's a tree and now we have these puffs what looks like to our eyes small puffs and th these clouds kind of look like fish scales. They give rise to a mackerel sky, okay? And hint, they're very, th they're thin. Cirrocumulus. Okay, we have some more trees. 
we have what looks like some old TV antennas, right? Um, depending on what day you're viewing this. Okay, Memory Bank Monday, Toss Back Tuesday, Way Back Wednesday, Throw Back Thursday, Flashback Friday. Okay, what about for the weekend? Hmm. Still going back Saturday? So, back in the day, people used to have TV antennas. People used to have rabbit ears on their TVs, but on the roofs, they might have these old TV antennas before we had cable, before we had Netflix, right? Anyhow, that's a bit of a side. So we have these, what looks like light to moderate gray puffs. Okay. Now notice that the puffs are larger than the cirrocumulus. So what that should tell you is that they're lower, right? Because they, they appear larger, I should say, okay, to our eyes because they're closer, okay? They're not that large, okay, and they're light gray puffs. These are alto cumulus. Now, here's a beach, right? Nice place to be. Here, here's, well, this is the beach, right? And this is the water, right? Do you consider the water the beach? Um, and here's a dock, okay, extending out. And... Now you have puffy clouds, but you definitely notice they're even, to your eyes, they appear larger still than the cirrocumulus or the altocumulus, okay? And they're darker in color, dark gray, okay, generally, okay? The, the edges appear lighter in color, but the most of the body of the clouds, the bottom of the clouds appears dark gray. These are stratocumulus. Hmm. We have a, a valley here, and uh, we have hills on either side. What we have here is a sheet-like cloud that could be covering the entire sky. Okay, it's a sheet-like cloud, and it's very close to the surface. Okay, it's not high above the surface here, so it's a low cloud, right? This is stratus. And by the way, if you were here on the ground here and the stratus cloud is on the ground, we call that fog. Fog is just a stratus cloud on the ground. Okay, moving forward, we have some grasslands spotted with trees. Okay, this could be the hills east of San Jose, perhaps. And we have some fair weather puffy clouds. Okay, familiar clouds. These are cumulus clouds. Hmm, here's an airplane. And we see this tail following the airplane. And this is a cloud that's formed as a result of water vapor depositing onto the uh, uh, exhaust emitted, exhaust particles emitted by the plane. This is this contrail, right? And you might ask, how would the Earth's climate change as a result of more aircraft contrails? Okay, I'll leave that question for you to think about. Because um, I think that's a good question to think about since in the future we could expect more planes, right? What's happened to the number of flights over time? It's, they've increased, right? As population has increased, as the world has become more globalized and so goods and people have to be, travel farther distances, the number of flights has increased, okay? So... Would more contrails cause climate to warm or cool? Let's switch gears and let's start talking about the seasons. Okay. There are four seasons in the year, right? Seasons are a way to um, separate out the year. Okay. Um, divide the year. Okay. And generally we have four seasons. Okay. We know of, of the four astronomical seasons. Okay, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Some places, though, have less changes in weather over the course of a year, and they might only have two seasons, okay? Um, like San Diego really only has two meteorological seasons, okay? Of course, they have four astronomical seasons, but since the temperatures between summer and winter don't vary as much as, say, somewhere like Chicago or New York. They really, meteorologic, don't only have a couple of seasons, right? It doesn't snow, it doesn't get too cold in wintertime, and it doesn't really get extremely hot in summertime in San Diego. 
but and and the tropics places in the tropics only have one weather season really okay because the temperature and precipitation is very consistent over the course of a year but i have a question why do we have seasons okay this is a nice picture showing the different colors of the leaves okay you have green and some light uh brown or yellow okay of course you know in fall the leaves change color right it's very beautiful as the leaves change color and sometimes as the leaves are changing color you can see trees next to each other with multiple colors of leaves okay and you might see this in along camp in campus san jose state when you look at the trees you might see it downtown okay of course you see the leaves falling onto the ground but uh, the trees might next to each other might have some green leaves, some yellow leaves, some brown leaves, some red leaves. Very beautiful. And why do we have seasons? What causes seasons? Okay. So if you're going to explain to someone in a sentence what causes seasons, why do we have them, what would you say? So the reason for the astronomical seasons is not because of changing distance to the sun. That's not the primary reason, at least. Um, that is a po common misconception. But the reason that we do have the se astronomical seasons is because the Earth is tilted on its axis. Okay, It's tilted on its axis at an angle of about 23 and a half degrees, and that gives, and that gives rise <clears throat> to both changing uh, daylight hours over the course of a year, okay, more daylight hours in the summertime, less in the wintertime, and also changing solar angle. The sun is higher in the sky in the summer and lower in the sky in the winter, okay. Um, you will see that, in fact, the Earth is actually farthest from the sun over the course of a year during northern hemisphere winter. And that alone can show you that the Earth's changing distance to the sun over the course of a year is not the major reason that we have the seasons. So, it's important to understand some definitions as we go into more detail um, about the seasons. Starting with insulation. Insulation is just a fancy term for incoming solar radiation. Okay, It's a word that basically combines incoming okay you see the in solar you see the soul s-o-l-a and then radiation okay t-i-o-n or maybe a-t-i-o-n is the asian and just the s-o-l is the solar it's for the solar anyhow it's basically the amount of solar radiation that's coming into the atmosphere okay solstice have you heard of the term solstice you probably have okay there are two solstices per year. And what the solstice is, is a day of the year, there's two of them, when the sun shines directly overhead 23.5 degrees south or 23.5 degrees north at noontime. Now 23.5 degrees south is the Tropic of Capricorn. Okay, 23.5 degrees north is the Tropic of Cancer. And the two solstices that occur each year are the June solstice on June 21st, commonly called the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, and the December solstice on the December 21st, commonly called the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. Now on the June solstice, the sun shines directly overhead the Tropic of Cancer, 23 and a half degrees north at noon. And this is the longest day of the year and first day of summer in the northern hemisphere okay meanwhile it's the shortest day of the year and the first day of winter in the southern hemisphere okay so one thing you'll you may know already or or you you may remember or you'll be learning is that the seasons are basically reversed in the southern hemisphere okay now on the december solstice the sun shines directly overhead 23.5 degrees south at noon. And this is the shortest day of the year and first day of winter in the northern hemisphere, but the longest day of the year and first day of summer in the southern hemisphere. Okay. 
Um, and um, just for reference... In San Jose, there are about 15 hours of daylight and 9 hours of darkness on the June solstice, about 9 hours of daylight and 15 hours of darkness on the December solstice, okay? And one thing that you'll learn is that as, as you go uh, to a higher latitude, the higher the latitude, the greater the difference in length of seasons, or length of daylight between the seasons, okay? So, for example, at, in, um, in Alaska, okay, the uh, days are extremely long in the summertime, and the nights are extremely long in the wintertime, okay? I went to Anchorage in early July of 2015, and Anchorage is pretty moderate with respect to weather and the changing daylight um, hours over the course of the year for Alaska, okay? It's pretty far south in Alaska. And even there, in early July, sunset was near midnight, okay, and sunrise was around 4 a.m., okay? And that's um, uh, the time in between, the four hours between, it's not all completely darkness. Of course, there's twilight, there's some light even after sunrise, excuse me, even after sunset and before sunrise, okay? Now, equinox, what do you think equinox means, okay? What's equa mean? equal. What about Nox? Nighttime. There are two equinoxes each year. The vernal equinox on March 20th, called, sometimes called the spring equinox in the northern hemisphere, and the autumnal equinox, sometimes called the fall equinox in the northern hemisphere, on September 22nd or 23rd. The day can vary a little bit depending on the year. Okay, So equinox means equal night. An equinox is a day of the year, again, there's two of them, when the sun shines directly overhead the equator at noontime, okay? And on an equinox, every place on Earth has 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of darkness, okay? Equal day and equal night, okay? So whether you're in San Jose, New York, Alaska, Antarctica, okay, wherever you are, North Korea, there's going to be 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness on um, on the equinox, March 20th, vernal equinox, September 22nd or 23rd, autumnal equinox. And the significance for um, defining the seasons is that the vernal equinox on March 20th is the first day of spring in the northern hemisphere, first day of fall in the southern hemisphere, while the autumnal equinox is the first day of Autumn or fall in the northern hemisphere, first day of spring in the southern hemisphere. Okay. Now we also have a, ter a term here, subsolar point. That's the latitude at which the sun is directly overhead at noontime on a particular day. Okay. So the subsolar point is basically the latitude, okay, where y you'd have to go in order for the sun to be directly over at your head at noon time, okay? Um, and the subsolar point it, um, varies over the course of a year between 23.5 degrees south, Tropic of Capricorn, and 23.5 degrees north, Tropic of Cancer, okay? Um, as of the recording of this video in mid-July, the subsolar point is in the northern tropics, okay? It reached 23.5 degrees north on the uh, recent June solstice, okay? And now in mid-July, it's south of there, but it's still north of the equator, okay? As we continue going forward over the next couple months, by September, late September, the subsolar point will have um, traveled south to the equator. And then three months later, into late December, the subsolar point will be at 23.5 degrees south before afterward it begins uh, traveling north again. Now, um, the continental United States of America is out of the range of the subsolar point. Okay, so no state in the continental U.S., as well as Alaska, can experience the sun directly overhead at noontime. Okay? Um, but the latitude of Hawaii, 
okay, ranges from 19 to 22 degrees north. So Hawaii is basically just south of the um, uh, northern extent of the subsolar point, okay, it's south of the Tropic of Cancer. So in fact, in Hawaii, you can experience the sun directly overhead at noontime, twice per year, okay, and there you could take a photograph of someone um, or yourself, okay, with the sun directly overhead and your shadow would basically be directly on your feet, okay, it wouldn't extend in any direction really, okay, It'd be directly on you, right? So, here is a side view of how sunlight strikes the earth on the on equinox. And it's a very useful figure to look at to help us understand um, the importance of solar energy um, angle, solar angle, okay? So, at the equator, you have solar energy focused on a small area. Okay, as you can see. Now the Earth is a sphere, and because of the geometry of the Earth, at the poles, such as here the North Pole, the solar energy is spread out over a larger area. Okay, so you see this solar energy coming in, and because of the geometry of Earth, it's it intercepts the Earth's surface, okay, over a larger area at the poles, both the North Pole and the South Pole, than the equator. And so because of that, the solar energy per area is more intense at the equator than over the poles. The, the amount of solar energy doesn't change. The sun still emits the same amount of radiation regardless of where you are on Earth, 93.5 million miles away. But that same amount of sun, sun radiation or solar energy, okay, or solar radiation is spread out over a greater area at the poles than the equator on the equinox. And in general, throughout the year. And this causes the solar energy to be weaker per area, okay, less intense at a point over the poles than the equator, okay? So when we talk about sun angle, um, one analogy to use, and you can test this out for yourself, is basically a flashlight over a piece of paper. When the sun is high in the sky, directly overhead, that's analogous, okay, that's, that's relatable, if you will, to having a, a, a flashlight shining perpendicular to a piece of paper, okay? Then, if the sun is lower in the sky, okay, closer to the horizon, its angle is lower, okay? So you can think about that as if you tilt the flashlight lower, okay? And so what happens? Question, what happens as you lower the angle of the flashlight? What happens to the area of the beam on the paper? Okay, and this doesn't have to be a paper. This could be a whiteboard, okay? It spreads out, okay? And if you continue to lower it more and more until it was um, almost parallel to the orientation of the paper, it would be extremely large. The beam would be... Ex um, spread out over an extremely large area. But would it be as bright would the be, be would the um, beam on the paper with the area on the uh, uh, on the paper okay that's under the beam would that be as bright as if you had the sun if you had the flashlight directly over the paper it wouldn't. So what happens is, as you, uh, um, lower the flashlight angle, okay, the area of light cast upon the paper spreads out. It becomes larger, okay, but because, but what happens is the amount of light coming out of the flashlight doesn't change, okay, so you have the same amount of energy spread out over a greater area, so it, the brightness is less per area, okay? The beam now on the paper looks less intense per area, okay? Because um, you have the same amount of energy over a greater area, so it's the light is less intense per area. Same idea with sun angle. When the sun is lower on the horizon, it has to pass through um, 
a great amount of atmosphere for one, but the amount of energy is uh, from the sun is spread out over a larger area on Earth, so you have less energy per area. Okay. So in the poles, in the polar regions, in the high latitudes, the solar energy is spread out over a larger area, so it's less intense per area. Whereas in the tropics, the, the sun is high in the sky year-round, so you have more direct radiation. So what influences incoming solar energy per area each day? Okay. There's two factors. The sun's angle of incidence, okay, how high it is in the sky, basically, and the length of time the sun shines each day. And both of these fa um, factors, okay, that affect incoming solar energy per area are a result of the Earth being tilted on its axis, okay? If the Earth was not tilted on its axis, Okay, everywhere on Earth would experience 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness, and the sun's angle in the sky wouldn't change over the course of a year at a location. Now, that's not to say that the poles would, wouldn't, would now not receive less energy per area, okay? The sun would still be lower in the sky um, uh, at the poles, but it wouldn't vary over the course of a year, okay? Everywhere would have this... The sun would basically... Think of it this way. The sun would take the same path across the sky every day, and so it would take the exact same path, and so it would uh, be in the... Uh, above the horizon for the same amount of time as well, okay? But the Earth... We know that's not true. We know the Earth is tilted on its axis. And we know that... When the sun is lower in the sky, there's less incoming energy per area, okay? Whereas if the sun is higher in the sky, there's more incoming energy per area. So why is it colder in the wintertime and warmer or hotter in the summertime, okay? How hot or cold, you know, it is between, um, it is during summer and winter, of course, depends on where you are. But in the winter time, the sun's lower in the sky, so the energy, the sunlight, the solar radiation per area is less, okay? Whereas in the summertime, the sun is higher in the sky, so you have more direct radiation, okay? And the other reason that it is cooler in the sum, uh, winter and warmer in the summer is because of the length of daylight changing. In the summertime, there are more sun hours. So in the summertime, not only is the sun higher above the horizon, okay? Not only is the sun higher in the sky and so there's more radiation per area striking the surface, but also it's in the sky for a longer amount of time. Whereas in the wintertime, there are less hours of daylight, okay? There are less hours of daylight and even when the sun is above the horizon, it's low in the sky and so the energy is spread out over a larger area than in the summer, okay? Make sense? Here is a figure from your book showing a northern hemisphere location and how the sun takes a different path of across the sky in June and December. Okay? So here's your location. Here's a house and what's this? Uh, uh, maybe this is an apartment building and another small building. And you're basically looking at this collection of buildings from the east, okay, from the east, okay, so here's south to the left, here's north to the right, we know that the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west, okay, hopefully we remember that, if you're on the Pacific Ocean, you can see a sunset, if you're on the Atlantic Ocean, you can see the sun rise over the water, or aqua, okay, so, June sun, this could be the June solstice, and here sun rises at 4.30 a.m., the sun comes up above the horizon and it takes a slowly across the course of the day. It takes its path across the sky, reaches a point at noontime, right? Sun is highest in the sky at noon. Although with daylight savings time, this, the actual solar noon might be an hour off the uh, um, the uh, local noon, okay? And then the sun, after solar noon, the sun gets lower and lower in the sky until it reaches the horizon at sunset. And here, at this location, sunsets at 7.30 p.m. 
So how many hours of daylight are there? Okay, good math question, right? Um, 15, right? You know, so you know that as you go between a.m. and p.m., the same number between a.m. and p.m., okay, 4.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., that's 12 hours, and then 4.30 to 7.30 p.m., that's another three hours, so 12 plus 3 is 15, okay? Now, here's what the path of the sun across the sky looks like in December at this location. Sun rises three hours later at 7.30, and the sun comes up above the horizon, and notice... It's lower in the sky, okay? It still gets higher in the sky as the day goes on, but at noontime, at solar noon, it's lower in the sky. It's close to the horizon, in particular close to the southern horizon. And this is because at, in December, the subsolar point, of course, is further south, closer to the Tropic of Capricorn, whereas in June, the, the uh, uh uh, subsolar point is in the northern hemisphere, okay? And then the sun dips um, after solar noon, dips close to the horizon, and sun sets and at an early 4.30 p.m., okay, 4.30 p.m. And so how many hours of daylight are there? Only nine, nine hours of daylight and 15 hours of darkness, okay? So um Hopefully this gives you a um, understanding of how uh, the path of the sun across the sky is different between summer and winter for a northern hemisphere location. And hopefully you get the um, idea that uh, northern hemisphere locations receive more incoming solar radiation per area each day in June than December because not only the sun is higher in the sky, but it's in the sky for a longer period of time. Okay, and the uh, greater your latitude, the greater the difference in daylight hours over the course of a year. Okay, so just uh, recently in early July, um, I was in Portland, Oregon, where actually I grew up, and there in early July, sunset was around 9 p.m. Okay, which is later than it is in San Jose um, at any time of the year. Okay, and then I'd mentioned Alaska. If any of you guys have been there in the summer, you'll know that sunsets even later. Okay. Now, if you really want to be dramatic, you can talk about the poles, because the North Pole gets six months of darkness. It experiences six months of darkness and six months of daylight. Wow. Okay. Talk about a extreme event. So actually, right now, the uh, North Pole is experiencing constant daylight. The sun is not dipping below the horizon, and it won't dip below the horizon again until the upcoming um, autumn uh, equinox. Okay, so actually, the North Pole has constant daylight from the um, vernal equinox in March twentieth to the autumn equinox, September twenty second or twenty third. South Pole, the uh, has constant daylight from the autumn equinox to the vernal equinox, okay? So, that's, hopefully you understand the higher the latitude, the more extreme the difference in daylight between the seasons. And of course, at the tropics, where the latitude is zero or zero degrees, okay, there's always 12 hours of daylight and darkness, okay? Constant daylight. But even though the daylight hours are 12 and it's constant, it's still very hot there because the sun is always very high in the sky, especially at noontime. All right. So here's another um, figure for you. And hopefully this, this one, it's a really great figure. Hopefully this one really helps you understand why um, the angle is important in affecting the... Uh, uh, amounts of radiation received over the course of a year, okay? So here, we are now in July as I'm recording this. So we've passed the June solstice, or summer solstice as we call it in the Northern Hemisphere. Notice on the June solstice, okay, Northern Hemisphere looks tilted toward the sun, okay? It looks tilted toward the sun, okay? And you'll see that the um, subsolar point is the Tropic of Cancer. And as we go forward, the Earth 
revolves around the sun, and of course it rotates once on its axis every 24 hours, and it revolves around the sun once every 365.24 days. By the way, that's why we have leap day every four years, okay? This was a leap year, right, 2016. Um, we have a leap day every year, uh, four years because it really takes an, a quarter of a day extra beyond 365 days for the Earth to complete run revolution. So we have to account for that extra quarter of a day it takes for the Earth to revolve orbit around the sun. So September 22nd, the sun would be directly overhead the equator. Then notice when we get to December 21st, okay, the first day of winter in the northern hemisphere, the uh, December solstice. Notice that the northern hemisphere appears tilted away from the sun and the southern hemisphere tilted toward the sun. And can you get the idea that the sunlight is most direct, okay, over the Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and a half degrees south, okay? Here's a figure showing insulation, so now we understand that it means incoming solar radiation. With respect to latitude on what month? So, we're looking at basically um, a cross section, okay, from looking from the uh, east, going from the south pole to the north pole, seeing how insulation varies. And here's 9 degrees south. And here's 9 degrees north, okay? So what month do you think this graph represents, okay? December, March, June, or September. So study this diagram. Think about what we've been talking about, okay? Um, hint, think about when we've been talking about um, the subsolar point and where the sun is directly overhead at noontime, and then see what you come up with. Pause the video if needed. Okay, so I'll uh, help you through this. Notice that the greatest amount of insulation is, on this particular month, is in the Southern Hemisphere, okay? In the Southern Hemisphere, okay? Notice that there is no insulation north of about um, 50 degrees north latitude or so, okay? So think about that. When and there's so when do we have basically no sunlight? Okay, no sunlight in the northern um, polar regions in the Arctic. When do we have the greatest amount of insulation over the southern hemisphere? That's in December. Okay, it's in out of these four months. Okay, because. Um, if it was March or September, if it was March or September, folks, where would the greatest amount of insulation be? Where would the peak of this curve be? Where? It would be at the equator. Because remember, on the, in March and September, is that, those are the months, two months of the year, when the equator experiences the greatest amount of insulation, um, basically, um, because this, the uh, sun's directly overhead the equator on the March and September equinoxes. Now, if this figure was for June, where would you see this peak be? You'd see it in the northern tropics, okay? Because that's in June, in particular, in particular on June 21st, the June solstice is when um, the greatest amount of solar energy per area is focused on the Tropic of Cancer at 23 and a half degrees north. Okay, so we've been talking about a lot of concepts. We've been talking about solar angle. We've been talking about what the solstice is, the equinoxes mean. Okay, we've been talking about subsolar point. We've been talking about how daylight hours vary over the course of a year. Okay. So here are some questions to see, to, to see how you're doing. On June 21st, at what latitude is the sun directly overhead at noontime? The Tropic of Cancer. Okay. Now on September 22nd, at what latitude is the sun directly overhead at noon? Zero degrees, the equator, right? Remember how the equator is directly overhead 
um, excuse me, the sun is directly over the equator on the two equinoxes, March and uh, September equinoxes. How many hours of daylight are present at the south pole on February 20th? Okay, this is a little tricky, okay? Think about, we were talking about how the poles have six months of daylight and six months of darkness, okay? So the south pole has is one of the poles, 90 degrees south, so you're going to have six, six months of daylight, six months of darkness, right? Now, what season is it in the southern hemisphere on February 20th, okay? Well, what season is it in the northern hemisphere on February 20th? Winter time, okay? It's toward the end of uh, winter, right, Ast astronomically. So that means it's summer in the southern hemisphere, and if it's summer in the southern hemisphere, that means we have constant daylight at the south pole, so we have 24 hours of daylight at the south pole on February 20th. And then this question, this one really requires some critical thinking skills, so you'll want to read it, study it, pause the video, and come up with your answer, okay? Active learning, right? You can't just learn by me talking, right? Um, where would you expect to have longer days? 45 degrees north on June 21st or 50 degrees south on December 21st? What do you think? So for this question, I really want to see what you think and your reasoning behind your answer. So for this one, um, you will be submitting your your uh, choice and your reasoning in um, the discussion forum. Okay. Okay. Moving on. More on distance to the sun. Okay. So remember how we were talking about that changing distance to the sun over the course of a year is not the primary reason that we have seasons. Okay. Earth being tilted on its axis at an angle of 23.5 degrees is, okay? So, um, now let's start thinking about, even though if distance to the sun isn't the major reason for the seasons, if it can influence the seasons, okay? So, perhaps you might be thinking, well, maybe in the summertime, you know, the Earth is closer to the sun and the sun is higher in the sky in the Northern Hemisphere. If you're talking about Northern Hemisphere summer, right? In the Northern Hemisphere summer, you're thinking, well, the Earth's closer to the sun, and the days are longer, and the sun's higher in the sky, so maybe that all helps to make it warmer, okay, in the months of July and August um, in the Northern Hemisphere. So let's think about this, okay? Let's think more about distance to the sun and how it can affect the seasons, or if it does, okay? So here's a question we need to under answer. Over one calendar year, when is the Earth closest to the sun? When is it farthest away? Okay. It turns out that the Earth's closest annual distance to the Sun occurs at perihelion, and the date that occurs is January 2nd to 5th. And that is during the winter time in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay. Now, every year is different, okay, so it's going to depend on the year, but somewhere between the 2nd of January and the 5th of January is when the Earth is going to be the closest to the Sun over the entire calendar year, okay? So out of all 365 or 366 days, somewhere in early January here, January 2nd and 5th, is when the Earth is closest to the Sun, okay? And on perihelion, or at perihelion, the Earth is about 91.5 million miles from the Sun, or 147 million kilometers for most of the world, okay? Remember how, on average, the Earth is about 93 million miles from the Sun, so it's a little bit closer, okay, um, uh, at perihelion, okay? Now, the Earth's farthest annual distance from the Sun occurs at aphelion. Okay, occurs at aphelion. And um, aphelion takes place July 3rd through 6th. Most years it occurs on July 4th, okay, which coincides with the day that we celebrate America's independence, right? 
of July 4th, just passed, okay, um, as I'm recording. And so the thing is, you know, this July 4th has passed, but next year when you're getting ready, okay, and you, so you're in the line at, you know, the store, it could be Safeway, Costco, Foods Max, right, Knob Hill if, you know, you can afford it, or Whole Foods if you can afford it, even more so, right? But actually, maybe not Whole Foods, because I don't know if they carry everything I'm going to be talking about. Um, but you, you're in line, and you have your burgers, your hot dogs, right? You have your buns, okay? Maybe you have your fireworks, if you can live in a place that you can buy them. And, you know, you, you're clearly getting ready for the big day, right? And the checker asks you, are you, are you going to have a really big uh, Independence Day, 4th of July party? You say, no! It's Aphelion, don't you know? Okay? You're celebrating Apelian, right? That's why you want to have a party and turn up, okay? So that could help you remember uh, the, when Apelian occurs. And um, by the way, it's just a joke. I'm only kidding, okay? I happen to have an American flag in my bed, hanging in my bedroom, uh, American flag lapel pin that I wear on uh, sport coats while teaching. But it just is very interesting that the day of the year when Earth is farthest from the sun is also the day of America's independence, okay? USA, right? And on this day, the Earth is 94.5 million miles from the sun. So, here now, um, what we can see is that when the Earth is... Um, Closer to the sun, especially closest to the sun, okay, we know that occurs in early January, but that's very close to late December. That's when the Earth is, uh, northern hemisphere of the Earth is tilted from the sun. And notice when the Earth is in this fashion, when the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun, right? Can everyone see that? The northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. Notice that the Earth is farther away from the sun, right? Now this figure is greatly exaggerated, okay? But can you see how when the Earth is closer to the sun, okay, especially when the Earth is closest to the sun over the course of a year, I should say, northern hemisphere is tilted away, it's, it's winter time. Whereas when the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun in summertime, the Earth is actually farther away from the sun, okay? And by the way, GM, gigameter, means 1 million kilometers, okay? So 152 million kilometers is about 94.5 million miles. So, what we've seen is that over the course of a year, Earth is actually closest to the Sun in Northern Hemisphere winter, and farthest in Northern Hemisphere summer, okay? And this is proof that the seasons are not only caused by changing distance to the Sun, right? If they were, okay, if the only reason for the seasons was changing distance to the Sun, then it should, it should make sense that... Um, the northern that the uh, Earth was farther away in northern hemisphere winter. The Earth is farther from the sun in northern hemisphere winter and closer to the sun in northern hemisphere summer, right? But this isn't the case. When it's coldest in the northern hemisphere in winter, the Earth is actually closer to the sun, okay? And when it's warmer in the northern hemisphere during summer, the Earth is actually farther from the sun, okay? But what about the southern hemisphere, okay, where the seasons are reversed? So, when the Earth is closest to the Sun, during perihelion, what season is it in the Southern Hemisphere? Summer. Because perihelion occurs in early uh, January, that's summer in the Southern Hemisphere. That's um, when the, in the Southern Hemisphere, that's the season when it's days are longer, the Sun's higher in the sky. When the Earth is farthest from the Sun, and that occurs at aphelion, right, what season is in the Southern Hemisphere? Well, in early July, it is winter in the Southern Hemisphere, okay? And the Olympics are coming up, by the way, in August, right, of 2016. And the Olympics are going to play, take place in Rio de Janeiro, um, Brazil, okay, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that is in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, it's very tropical there, okay? It's a low-latitude place, but... It is, it is true to say that it's, it, astronomically, it's technically going to be wintertime there, okay? But meteorologically, 
Um, it's very warm there. It's tropical. And meteorologically, there aren't really four distinct seasons. It's pretty warm year-round, okay? But um, when you were younger, okay, or when you were very young, back in 2000, the uh, Summer Olympics were held in Sydney, Australia. And there, were, there was a big deal um, about the seasons when that occurred because when it's Northern Hemisphere summertime, it's Southern Hemisphere wintertime, and Australia is in the mid-latitudes um, to account for the fact that Australia is in the Southern Hemisphere, the uh, timing of the Olympics was changed, okay? So the Olympics that year actually took place in um, um, er, early October, <coughs> excuse me, early October, when it was fall, actually, early fall in the Northern Hemisphere, but early spring in the Southern Hemisphere, okay? Because if the Olympics had taken place in Northern Hemisphere summer in, say, uh, August, like usual, it would be the middle of winter in, in Australia. It would be far too cold for the athletes to um, participate in their, southern, in their summer sports. Okay. That was a little bit of a tangent, but um, it's pretty interesting, I think. Okay, I like to try to show the relevance of uh, the material to, you know, what's going on in the world. So... While the effects of solar angle and distance to the sun are out of phase for the northern hemisphere, they're in phase for the southern hemisphere, okay? In the southern hemisphere, when it's warmer, the, okay, when it's warmer because the days are longer, the sun's higher in the sky, the earth is closer to the sun. When it's colder because the days are shorter and the sun is lower in the sky, okay, not, not only is, are those two things true, but the earth is actually um, farther from the sun, okay? So you might be wondering... Could this make the Southern Hemisphere's seasons more extreme, okay? Could the Southern Hemisphere extreme, uh, seasons be more extreme, okay? Because you get this added added um, factor of uh, distance to the sun, okay, being in line with the uh, two major uh, influences on incoming solar energy per area each day. Well, we need to look at a map, right? Here's the world. Here is the equator dividing the northern and southern hemisphere. And I have a question for you. Where is most of the world's land um, uh, concentrated, okay? Northern or southern hemisphere, it's in the northern hemisphere, right? There's very little land in the southern hemisphere, okay? So um, you can see the southern hemisphere is mostly water. About two-thirds of the world's land is in the northern hemisphere. Only one-third is in the southern hemisphere, okay? So because the southern hemisphere has a substantially lower amount of land area than the northern hemisphere, greater seasonality is negated. Okay? Water has a higher specific heat than land, and that means that it takes more energy to warm up or cool down.